that's waiting up for me that I call my own through the dark through the door through where no one's been before but it feels like home they can say they can say it all sounds crazy they can say they can say I've lost my mind I don't care I don't care if they call me crazy from far away special things I compile each one there to make you smile on a rainy day they can say they can say it all sounds crazy they can say they can say we've lost our minds Please be seated. 
Today is a very special Sunday in the life of our church here at Pleasant Hill. All Sundays are special, but this one is extra special because we recognize uh, a milestone uh, in some of our students' life that are here, that are part of our youth ministry here at Pleasant Hill. Uh, today is Baccalaureate Sunday, and we want to celebrate this occasion uh, with our seniors that are graduating from two different high schools here. Uh, we have one that's graduating from Lamar County High School in Vernon and have another one graduating uh, from New Hope High School. We actually have two graduating from New Hope High School. As you'll see, you saw three seniors in the uh, slideshow. Uh, one was planning to be here, but Kenzie Ray could not make it to be with us today. So y'all make sure uh, and extend your congratulations to her uh, when you see her, uh, maybe later on today or, or, or later on when you see her. But at this time, we want to honor our graduates and I want you to give them a round of applause as they come up. As most of y'all know me, my name is Dalton Sims. I go to Lamar County High School in Vernon, Alabama. I've been at this church six seven years since Brother Gene. We had the old sanctuary, and that's when I got baptized. So it's been, I've seen, you know, most of y'all familiar faces, most of y'all new faces that I haven't gotten around to. But I plan on going to Bevel State Community College for a degree in teaching, and then transfer to another school, maybe two years, three years, I don't know. Later on in life, I guess. And then I don't, it's undecided what I plan to do after college. I'll probably look for a job, maybe here, maybe somewhere else. I don't know, I, I, I'm going off this card that he gave me. I, I wasn't prepared, honestly. Dalton was speechless about 15 minutes ago, if you can imagine that. So we love you, Dalton. It's the gift from Pleasant Hill. We love you. You'll get your pastor later. Oh, is this way? <laughs> hey, my name is Summer Barton. I'm graduating from New Hope High School. I plan on attending Bonds Beauty School next month for cosmetology. One more time, give our seniors a round of applause. You stand to see the good of Jesus Christ. Come on.
sweet to be seated. Good morning and welcome to Pleasant Hill Baptist Church. We're so thankful that you made the decision to worship with our family of faith here on this hill. Uh, it's just such a, a blessing to worship with each and every one of you uh, every time that we gather together as a family to lift up our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And if you're new to the family of faith here at Pleasant Hill, you should have received one of these programs that like this when you came into our sanctuary. Uh, we have something that we need, uh, we need your help with. If you're new, we would like for you to take this little fold-out portion in your program and fill that out and tear it off and place it in the offering plate at the conclusion of our worship service. Uh, so we'll have some more information about you and how we can pray for you and also how to better minister to you. So make sure and help us with that. Uh, also, if you're here this morning, you're, you're part of our family each and every week and you've got some prayer concerns in your life, make sure and fill out that same card. Place it in the offering plate at the conclusion of the worship service and we'll, be, uh, we'll also pray for you uh, throughout this week. Thank you so much for making the decision to be with us today and worship with us today. Let's continue to worship through song. How's everybody today? Everybody doing good? You can sit down right by my leg, right there. Do you know what this is that I have on? It's a dress, isn't it? Looks like one, doesn't it? It kind of looks like a dress. They're called a gown. A gown. And you see those two back there? They have one on too, and so does Brother Franklin, so does Brother David, because we're honoring these seniors now. Do you know, you know what they're doing? You know what they're getting ready to do? Graduate. You know what that means? You graduate and the fun is over. That's right. Fun's over because you're now becoming an adult. And guess what? At one time, they were small like you. At one time, they were thinking, I'm never going to get out of high school. They were thinking, it's a long way away, but let me tell you something, time goes by real fast, and then you graduate from kindergarten, you graduate from elementary school, go through middle school, then you graduate from high school, and then you find there's a big world out there, but as you go into that big world, and as they go into that big world, and as you and I navigate through this world we're in, we need a little help. We need a little help. We get help from our parents. We get help from our teachers. We get help from our friends. But we need a stronger guidance. We need somebody who can help us a little bit better. And that's the Holy Spirit. God said, I'm going to send one. And God's Spirit guides us. It's good to have book knowledge to be smart in certain areas, to graduate, and to keep moving on. But when you move on, you got to know where you're going. You have to have a place to go. And the place to go is where God wants you to be, and he'll lead you. Do you know that God has a plan for their lives? 
You know, Dalton said, I might get a job when I get out of college. I can assure you he's going to get a job. I'm going to assure you he's going to get a job. Summer is going to get a job. God has a plan for them. And guess what? He has a plan for you too. It's going to be hard for you to know it right now. But you see this Bible you have? Trust it and read it and follow God. And he has a plan to bless you, not to harm you. Okay? All right, let's pray together. Father, we thank you today for your grace, for your mercy, for your goodness that you bestow on all of us. We're thankful for our seniors today. I'm thankful for these children because one day they too will graduate and move on. We ask your blessings as they go through their time of worship. In your son's name we pray. Amen. <coughs> Yesterday, when our arms held you softly, we watched you play, but the grace turned to years, and so quickly you've grown, you could stay, 
but I know you must go. It will never be the same again. Never be like it was then. But our love will never change, and the memories remain. It will never be the same again. shape your values we taught you what's right we gave you our love and we showed you God's light we never could own you we knew from the start but to remember just whose child you are letting go is a lesson that's so but we're learning it's not the ending but our love is yours this is not goodbye cause for you life is only beginning it will never be the same Never be like it was then, but our love will never change, and the memories remain. It will never be the same again. I like that song. Franklin for making everybody cry this morning even if you don't have a senior that's graduating it is a hallmark moment in the life of our church It's a hallmark moment in these young people's lives so let me encourage you this morning to offer them a word of encouragement and well wishes you don't have to wish them good luck because there is no such thing as luck I believe in Christ. I don't believe in luck. And I believe that God has a plan for every life, and that plan is to bless them and not to harm them. He has a plan for, for them, and I hope that God will begin to show them where he wants them to go. However, in life, there are going to be times when it's all going to go south. It has for me. And it has for you. And you don't think that things can ever get worse. And guess what? It does. And so Dalton and Summer, you need to realize today that when you get out in the world, you are going to mess up. You are going to mess up big time. So today we want to give you a road map, a road map that will help you when things go south and you find yourself in a place that you never thought you'd be. Let's honor the reading of God's word as we look in the gospel according to Luke. We'll begin reading in chapter 15 and read verse 1 and then we will skip down to verse 11. It's a lot of passages of scripture. If you find yourself about to pass out, go ahead and sit down. But I think you can probably make it. Here we have now the word of our Lord. 
Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear Jesus, and that is key. That is paramount. You need to understand that. Jesus continued in verse 11. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the young son got together all that he had and set out for a distant country where he squandered his wealth in wild living. And after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out as a citizen to that country, who sent him to the fields to feed the pigs. And he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And when he came unto himself, or when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death? I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. And the son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it, and let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost, and now he is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. And when he came near the house, he heard the music and dancing. And so he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied. Your father has killed the fatted calf, and he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been serving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never even gave me a young goat that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours has squandered all of your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fatty calf for him. My son, the father said, you have always been with me. And everything that I have is yours but we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive he was lost and now he is found and this is the word of God for the people of God may God add his blessings to the reading of his holy inspired word and all God's people together said thank you you may finally sit down Whenever I read those passages of Scripture, I can see the looks on your face. All of a sudden, the wheels start turning in your mind, and you go, okay, here we go again. Another story on the prodigal son. I've heard this before. I wonder if he just couldn't find a new sermon. We just kind of redid an old one, and here he is talking about a subject that I've heard since the time that I was a child. But this is what you and I need to understand. God's word is never old. It is fresh and powerful every time that it's told. In this passage of scripture, we have a young man who went bad. He messed up. Everything in his life went south. And I believe that all of us can identify with this young man. We've been there. We've done that. We've got the t-shirt. There have been moments when we've looked at where we are and have asked the question, how did I get here? But just because you're familiar with the story doesn't mean that you know the story. I can't tell you how many times I have just been talking to regular church people. And I will talk about the prodigal son. And I will say, you know that story, don't you? And they will look at me as if I have three heads. The story just eludes them. 
But even for those of us who have heard the story since we were knee-high to a grasshopper, we also need to realize that familiarity often brings with it contentment. Think for a moment. Where did Jesus have the hardest time? It was in his hometown. His hometown of Nazareth. When he preached his first sermon to the people who were familiar with him, to the people that knew him from the time that he was a child to now that he was an adult, when he preached that sermon, the people didn't say, oh, what, what a marvelous preacher boy Mary and Joseph have raised. No, they wanted to kill him. As a matter of fact, they tried to, to push him off a cliff, but he slipped through their grasp. When he began his public ministry, the main enemy for Christ were those who were familiar with the Old Testament Scripture. They were the leaders in the law. They had spent their life studying the Old Testament, looking for when the Messiah was going to come to this earth. They should have known, if anyone knew, they should have known that Jesus was the suffering Messiah that Isaiah had prophesied about years before. So here's a question. Why did Jesus tell this parable? Maybe a better question is, to whom did he tell this parable? I want you to look at his audience. Because it tells you at the very beginning of that passage of Scripture where I said, this is paramount. In the audience that day were a bunch of sinners. There were tax collectors. Prostitutes, the outcast of society. And yet, these are the people that Jesus spent a majority of his time with while he was here on this earth. And he was criticized for doing it. As a matter of fact, the religious leader said this about Jesus He's a blasphemer and a wine guzzler. Why do you think that Jesus spent so much time with the sinners? Better yet, why did sinners enjoy spending time with Jesus? Because his goodness was never offensive. But yet the religious leaders were saying, you know, you can tell a lot about somebody by, by the company they keep. And we've adopted that same philosophy, haven't we? But a doctor spends a lot of his time with sick people. That doesn't mean that he's sick. A funeral director spends a great deal of time with dead folks. That doesn't mean he's dead. A lawyer spends a great deal of time with, with criminals, but that doesn't mean that he himself is guilty of any crime. And though Jesus spent a great deal of time with sinners, he himself never sinned. But yet these outcasts of society felt right at home with the most, or with the only perfect man that ever walked the face of the earth. He never sinned. But yet these folks that couldn't find a place at the table anywhere felt at ease with Jesus. They loved being around him. Do you know why? He loved them as they were and not as they ought to have been. And that's the way it is today with us. You do understand that God loves you as you are and not as you ought to be. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. He loves you and there's not one thing in this world that you can do that's going to make him love you any more. And there's not a thing that you can do in this world that's going to make him love you any less. He accepted these people and he listened to their stories and they felt important in his eyes. So today, if you're kind of suffering with a little bit of, of, of self-love, then you need to understand that God loves you as you are. God accepts you. You might be struggling with your with your parents, you might be struggling with your spouse, you may be struggling with your parents or your, your children, but God loves you, and God desires to redeem you and give you a plan for your life. 
The critics of Jesus labeled their judgment on him by his company. And then he told three parables right in a row. He told a parable about a lost sheep that, that wandered off. It, yeah, he was found. He told about a lost coin that was carelessly misplaced, but then discovered. And then he told a story about a son that broke his father's heart, took his inheritance, squandered it, but yet came back. You see, these parables demonstrate that God loves differently to those who respond to him. He loves differently to those who mess up in life. And the thing of it, you need to know about life, especially Dalton Summer, life is messy. Have you noticed that? It's real messy. As a matter of fact, it's a lot like your room at home. It's just a mess. It's like your car. It needs to be cleaned. Life seems to get more complicated the older that we get. I used to love to listen to the Statler Brothers. Has anybody even heard of the Statler Brothers this day and time? The class of 57 had its dreams. And then he says in that song, things get complicated when you get past 18. Oh, the class of 57 had its dream. You about to find out? Life gets complicated. It gets real complicated. And I hate to tell you this, you will never have it as good as you've had it the last 18 years. And you're thinking, oh, yes, I will. I'm about to get out on my own. Good. You know what that means? You're going to be poor and have nothing to do. <laughs> and no money to do it with. But what we need to understand this morning, and what I want you two to hear, if you don't hear anything else, is that when you mess up, you can always come home. When you mess up, Heavenly Father is always anxious to bring you back where you belong. See, here's the problem. Many of us have a problem in our lives, and that is we go looking in strange places for the things that we think that we want. We go looking for things that we already have. Jesus made it clear in these three parables that we look in strange places, we do strange things, and then we come home to find the things that we were looking for somewhere else. In this parable, we see a progression of searching and doing and then returning. There's a yearning for you guys, I understand this, to experience life. Experience to the fullest. I am going to go make my mark in life. No more rules at home. No more teachers telling me what to do. I get to go out and be my own man and my own woman. But the most of us have suffered the greatest disappointment in life is that we're waiting for something bigger and better to come along. And that yearning and that hunger prompts us. You know what it does? It prompts us to stoop down and to do things we never thought we would do rather than to reach up and to be what God wants us to be. In our story, look at the young man. He goes from city to city, from sensation to sensation, to bar to bar, to woman to woman, and he never found it. The more he looked, the less he lived, the more he did what he liked, the less he liked what he did, and the more that he fed his physical hunger, the closer he came to famine. It happens. Man, we're living. Man, this is great. And when you are the life of the party and you're buying everybody drinks and you're saying the rounds are on me. And when the money runs out, so do the friends. Or those who so call themselves friends. Our young man in our story thought that he would end up in utopia but he ended up in a pigsty. But while he was in a pigsty, Scripture says this. He came to his senses. 
He had an epiphany, an aha moment. He came into himself. He took a personal inventory. So, if you have your outlines with you, you can get them out right now. We'll give you a few lessons to take with you this morning. And that is, first, you've got to be honest with yourself. That's what this young man did. He was honest with himself. He said, what is the son of my father doing here in a pigsty? Tell you what I'll do. I'll go back. Listen to what he says. I will go back and I will say I have sinned. I will take responsibility for where I am. Most of us in life feel guilty. Do you know why we feel guilty? Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? Anyone? We are guilty. We are guilty. Scripture tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is not one that is innocent. We need to sense the Father's presence. How many times have you heard somebody say something like this? I don't go to church and I'm not going down to that church of yours because it's full of hypocrites. You know what I tell them? You're right. We got room for one more. We got room for one more. But really the opposite is true. This place here is not a collection of saints. This place called Pleasant Hill is a, is a collection of sinners. We're not perfect. We all need to feel the grace and the forgiveness of God. We need to have fellowship with fellow sinners because we've all been saved by grace and not of ourselves. You have to face your guilt because you are. So, once you take responsibility, once you come into yourself, and once you understand that you are guilty, there's some steps that you can take, and none of them are good. I'm telling you right now, none of them are good, and none of them are healthy. Once you come to yourself, once you start taking responsibility, and you're honest with your own actions, you can do a lot of things. You know what the first thing you can do is? You can destroy yourself. That's what Judas did. Judas went out and hung himself. And I'm going to tell you something. I just have to be as honest with you as I can. And especially to you guys. You two that are graduating. Do you know that there is not a person in this room, not a person created? Statistics tell us this. Everyone has had a fleeting thought of taking their own life. A problem, a situation in life that seems unmanageable. There's no way out. And so we say, oh, you know, I can spare my family embarrassment. I can spare my friends, you know, the shame. And they take their own lives. Listen closely. Number one, suicide is a permanent solution. To a temporary problem. Don't you ever forget that. The other argument that everybody has. And I kind of waffle on this. So if I waffle on this. I can imagine what everybody else is. Suicide's not the unpardonable sin. But. Talk about shedding of innocent blood. I would hate to meet my father in heaven. 
having taken the life, especially taking the life of my own. So, when it goes south, the easiest thing that you can do is just quit. Destroy yourself. That's not God's plan. Second thing you can do is destroy others. You can just destroy others. If you're not going to be happy, they're not going to be happy. So you begin to set out to wrong those people that have wronged you. You gossip, you slander, you, you, you do different things. The third thing that you do can do is this. You can just drop out. You can drop out. I graduated in 79, 89, and 99. And you got to throw 83 in there. 79, 83, 99. So I almost lose count. Every 10 years, I feel like I need to just put on a gown and walk. 79, 89, 99. And 83. You see what these stripes, you know what they represent? I told you earlier. It, it, it represents a doctrine. Probably Dalton, when I was a senior in high school, I was about as boneheaded as you. Okay? Didn't have a plan, didn't know what I was going to do. You know, the only reason I got into Mississippi College was m my parents were on a send three, get one free plane. <laughs> had my mom and daddy had gone there. My brothers had gone there. All three of my sister-in-laws had gone there. So I barely made high enough on the ACT to get in. They just felt sorry for me and let me in. I didn't know what I was going to do. I graduated. I didn't quit. A few years later, I went to seminary. Three years. To get my Master's of Divinity was 120 hours working and preaching. I didn't quit. When I got ready to do this, got midway through, guess what I wanted to do? Quit. Called home one night after I'd been raked over the coals by one of my professors. The audacity of him. Called home and told Tommy Joe, said, I'm coming back home. I'm quitting. And she said, you're not. I said, oh, yes, I am. And she said, I'm going to call your daddy. <laughs> Look at my 30s. I'll call my daddy. What's my daddy going to say? She called my daddy. You know what my daddy said? Son, you ain't quitting. You know it takes little talent and no effort at all to quit. Very little talent, no effort at all to quit. To quit anything in life. Just gets hard, just quit. And that's what we're doing today as parents. We are raising a generation of quitters because our children come home from softball or baseball or ballet or piano and they say, Mom and Daddy, it's hard. And they say, well, darling, we don't want it to be hard for you. So you can just quit. And you're raising a generation that just says, when the going gets tough, the tough don't get going. When the tough gets going, we just throw in the towel and quit. It happens in church as well. When things get difficult, folks tend to drop out. The next thing that you can do, take a step towards finding yourself in God, is accept yourself. You've got to assume responsibility. Here is where I am. You've got to assume responsibility for your life because you get into a point in time now as you're transitioning into adulthood. And parents, grandparents, I want my parents to stand up. All my parents, not just through the graduates. All right, 
Yeah, all my parents. Now you grandparents stand up. I want everybody to see you. Listen closely. You can't fight every battle for your children, especially when they become adults. Sooner or later, you've got to turn them over to God and say, I've done the best I can do. Now you belong to the Lord. Can you do that? You're saying, uh, yeah, I can do that, liar, liar, pants on fire. You may be seated. Every now and then, every now and then, I'll get this. I miss church and nobody called me. I was in the hospital and nobody visited me. Because we didn't know. And what you're saying is the church is responsible for you. And there is truth in that. But let me tell you something. You're responsible to the church as well. Each member is responsible. The prodigal son realized this, and if he hadn't, his life would have never changed. When he came unto himself and he said, ah, I'm the one responsible for where I am. I did this. Today, the biggest indoor sport we have is dodging responsibility. The son could have said it was my father's fault for giving me the money in the first place. He should have had better sense than that. He ought to have known I can't manage money. He could have blamed it on his brother trying to follow in his footsteps. But he took responsibility. He said, I and I alone have done this. I will go back to my father. I will say that I have sinned against heaven and against you. I heard about a little boy who had a hard time remembering things. I mean, getting ready for school in the morning was a nightmare. He couldn't remember where anything was. So what he decided to do, the night that he was going to bed before he was going to get up the next morning, he was going to write a note to himself. And to remind himself where everything was. Get this down to a science. So he wrote this. Your shoes are under the bed. Your cap is in the closet. Your money, baseball cards are in the drawer. And you are in the bed. And you know what happened? The next morning he got up. And he found his shoes under the bed. He found his cap in the closet. He found his money and his baseball cards on the chest of drawers. But he wasn't in the bed. He didn't know where he was. But that wasn't like the prodigal. He came unto himself and said, I'm responsible. Today, many of us have lost ourselves because we've settled for less. We're searching and grasping the things of this world, which leads me to this. The prodigal found himself by going back where he lost himself. Have you ever noticed that this story has three main characters? The main characters are the father, the prodigal, and the brother. Who's the main character in the story? You might say the prodigal. And I would say you're wrong. The main character in the story is the father. It's God. So how do you think God is going to receive you, Summer, and Dalton, when everything goes south? In the story... There was no guilt trip. He said, my son. Daddies, can I talk to you for a moment? And grandfathers, how would you have reacted if this had been your boy? It's your son. Blew a third of your estate in a short period of time. 
He was an embarrassment. He drug your name through the mud. When he got home, what would you have done? I can tell you what some of you would have done. You go clean your smelly self up before you come before me, boy. Get that earring out of your ear. Go get you a haircut. You look like a girl. You smell like a pig. That's what we would say. You know what this dad did? He ran. He saw him at a distance. And isn't it funny how you can recognize your own child, even the silhouette of your child? This father did. And he ran. And he smelled awful. Have you ever smelled somebody that smelled bad? You ever been with somebody? All of the odor just, they smell like a polecat. Knocks you over. You know what this father did? He kissed him. And the son goes into this speech. Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. And the father says, shh, don't have time for that right now. Put a ring on his finger, put a sandals on his feet, put a robe around him. Now's not a time to dwell on the past. This was my son. He was dead. He's alive. We need to kill the fatty calf. We need to have a party. Understand today that repentance is a positive word. When we turn around, we are turning back to God. Now, the interesting part about this story is I would love it if the story ended there. It'd be a great story if it just ended there. Have there ever been moments when you wanted to edit the Bible? When it talks about gossip and slander and all that? Kind of want to edit it a little bit? This would be where I would want to edit it. Because the boy comes home, there's a party going on. But Jesus didn't end it there. The plot's just about to start and it's about to get heated up. He turns his, the table on his critics and the religious leaders. And he told them about another prodigal that never left his front porch. He talked about the religious folks. Now, picture this in your mind. Young son's home, smells like a pig, dad's received him, put a ring on his finger, put sandals on his feet, put a robe around him, killed the fatted calf. Did you read that they're dancing? You Baptist? Did you read that they're dancing? They're having a good time. They're cutting a rug. They're enjoying one another. And now we see an older brother who becomes indignant. He becomes indignant. Here we see an individual wallowing in self-pity. And you know what self-pity does? It robs us of the joy of today. He won't even go into the party. I can see him out there leaning up against a fence post, can't you? Just fuming. Fuming. Mad. Mad at his brother. He's mad at his father. And the dad comes out there to console him, as we daddies sometimes do. And I would imagine that, that the father puts his hand on his Older son's shoulder and his older son just pulls it away from him. He said, Daddy, I don't understand this. This son of yours, you notice he didn't say brother. My brother, he said, this son of yours has blown your money and riotous living with prostitutes. My question is, how did he know that? Where had he gotten his information? You think I believe, see, I believe big brother knew where little brother was. I believe 
Big Brother had followed along and knew exactly where Little Brother was and was watching this all unfold. And Big Brother's thinking, he is out of the picture now. I'm never going to have to worry about him. And he says this to his dad. I've been with you all these years. No, he hadn't. Folks, listen to me. You can be in church your entire life and be a country mile away from God. You can be a million miles away from God. I see it every year. I see it every week. People that sit in these pews, they know closer to God than a man in the moon. This guy was at home, but he wasn't with his dad. And he says to his dad, You've never thrown me a party. Wah, wah, wah. Whining, moaning, and groaning. Did he not understand that everything the father had was about to be his? Today, for those who have gone bad, and when everything has gone south, we often run from God. We need to run to God. Jesus said this. Come unto me, all you that labor heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He offers total forgiveness. If you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Here's where the rubber meets the road. And here's a moment that you're never going to forget for the rest of your life. The two of you, mark my words, you're going to muck it up. There's no doubt in my mind. You know why? You're human. I'm not saying you're going to intentionally go out and be bad because we all sin. When you majorly mess up, there's a place, it's called Pleasant Hill, that you can always come home. And those of you who will receive them as they are, when they come home, would you stand? There's no place that far. You can always come home. Father, we thank you today for your grace, for your mercy. You've given an invitation to all of the prodigals today to come home and not miss the party. And I pray that these seniors would realize down the road when they have messed up and things have gone south that you have a plan for their lives as we go through our time of invitation heavenly father strengthen us strengthen us for your calling give us the boldness to step out and trust you in your son's name we pray Amen. you may remain standing as we sing our hymn of invitation jesus is tenderly calling you home we open the doors of the church to any decision you feel God asking you to make. Maybe this morning you come giving your heart to Christ. Maybe you come transferring a church membership or the rededication of a life. Or maybe, just maybe, you need to go to one of these seniors and pray over them. Whatever you feel the Lord asking you to do, you do that as we stand and prayerfully sing.
Father, we're grateful that we have an opportunity to give back a portion of what you have blessed us with in material way. Bless both the gift and the giver. Use them to further enhance your kingdom here on this earth. In your son's name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Kind of a tradition here, you know, these young people begin coming down for the children's message, and even though we only got two, we're going to ask you guys to come down here and join me on the steps. I want to read you a story that is my favorite. It's all the places that you will go by Dr. Seuss. You guys, guess what? Of all the things I forgot, I forgot my glasses. So we're going to just try to wing this and see if I can see it. And if not, I'll just make it up as we go along. <laughs> Congratulations. Today is your day. You're off to great places. You're off and away. You have brains in your head. You have feet in your shoes. And you can steer yourself any direction you choose. And if you're on your own and you'll know what you'll know, you'll know you're the guy who'll decide where to go. You'll look up and down streets, you'll look them over with care. About some you'll say, I choose to not go there. With your head full of brains and your shoes full of feet, you're too smart to go down any not-so-good street. And you may not find any you'll want to go down. In that case, of course, you'll head straight out of town. It's opener there in the wide open air. Out there things can happen and frequently do to people as brainy and footsy as you. And when things start happening, don't worry, don't stew, just go right along and you'll start happening too. Oh, the places that you will go. You'll be on your way up, you'll be seeing great sights, you'll join the high flyers, you'll soar to high heights. You won't lag behind because you'll have the speed, you'll pass the whole gang and you'll soon take the lead. Wherever you fly, you'll be the best of the best and wherever you go, you'll top all the rest. Except when you don't because sometimes you won't. I'm sorry to say it's so, but sadly and true, that bang-ups and hang-ups can happen to you. And when you get all hung up in a prickly perch, the gang will fly on, you'll be left in a lurch. You'll come down from that lurch with an unpleasant bump, and the chances are you'll end up in a slump. And when you're in for a slump, you're in for not very much fun, for unslumping yourself is not easily done. You'll come to a place where the streets are not marked, some windows are lighted, but mostly they're dark. A place you can spring both your elbow and chin. Do you dare stay out or do you dare go in? How much can you lose and how much can you win? And if you should go in, should you turn left or right or right in three quarters or maybe not quite? Or maybe go around and sneak in from behind? Simple it's not, I'm afraid, for a mind make upper to make up his mind. You'll get all confused and you'll start into a race down a long wheeled road to a breakneck in pace and grind on for miles across weirdest wild space headed for towards the most useless place, the waiting place. For people are just waiting. They're waiting for a train to go or a bus to come or a plane to go or mail to come or the rain to go or the phone to ring or the snow to snow, waiting around for a yes or no, waiting for the hair to grow. Everybody's just waiting. Waiting for the fish to bite, waiting for the wind to fly a kite, waiting around for a Friday night, waiting perhaps for their Uncle Jake or a pot to boil or a better break or a string of pearls or a pair of pants or a wig with curls or another chance. Everybody's just waiting. No, that's not you. Somehow you'll escape all that waiting and straying, and you'll find the bright places where boom bands are playing. With banners flip-flopping, once more you'll walk real ride high, ready for anything under the sky, ready because you're that kind of guy. Oh, the places you'll go, 
There is fun to be done. There are points to be scored. There are games to be won. And the magical things that you can do with that ball will make you the winningest winner of all. Fame. You'll be famous as famous can be with the whole wide world watching you while you're on TV. Except when they don't because sometimes they won't. I'm afraid that sometimes you'll play lonely games too. Games you can't play because you'll play against you. All alone, whether you like it or not, alone is something you'll be quite a lot. And when you're alone, there's a very good chance you'll meet something that will scare you right out of your pants. There are some down that road between hither and yon that will scare you so much you won't want to go on. But on you will go, though the weather is foul. On you will go, though your enemies prowl. On you will go, though the hack and cracks howl. Onward, up a many a frightened creek, though your arms may get sore and your sneakers may leak. And on you will hike, and I know that you will hike far. And face up to the problems, whatever they are. You'll get mixed up, of course, as you already know. You'll get mixed up as many strange birds as you go. So you be sure when you step, be careful. Well, excuse me. Be sure when you step, step with great care and great tact. Remember, life's a great balancing act. Just never forget to be dexterous and deft. And never mix up your right foot with your left. And you will succeed. Yes, you will. Ninety-eight. Three-quarters percent guarantee. Kid, you will move mountains. So whether your name is Bucks, Bam, Bixby, Bray, Mordecai, Alley, Van O'Shea, or Summer, or Dalton, today is your day. Your mountain is waiting, so be on your way. This book I want you to take with you. When you go to college, sometimes read it and be reminded of the places that you will go. God bless you both. Have a few announcements I want you to be aware of. There is a shower for Kenzie today in the multipurpose building. She's going to be here in the hospital last night. She will be here. Also, Vacation Bible School, June the 2nd through the 6th. And if you have not signed up for that, you want to. We still have room for volunteers. Don't forget we have communion tonight at 6 p.m., the time where you can uh, remember the sacrifice that was paid for your behalf. And tomorrow night, here, Voices of Mobile. I know we have ball going on and we have different things that are taking place. But if you can get here, this is something you don't want to miss. This will be a night to be remembered. This is Roger Breland's last tour uh, with Voices of Mobile. It all started back with truth, I think around 1971. And so he is concluding his tour. So make sure that you're here. I want to thank you. And words could never express the depth of my gratitude to you. I have a debt to you that I could never pay back. Uh, this past Thursday, my grandson had that sedated MRI. And you'll know that 10 weeks ago, while he was still in the womb, they said his head was in the 99 percentile, his body was in the 24 percentile, and it didn't look good. He had fluid on his right and left ventricle of his brain. When he was born, his head was perfect and his body was perfect. But they did another MRI, and there was still fluid on the brain. They waited a few weeks, went to the neurosurgeon, sedated him on Thursday, sent him through the MRI. Doctor came in and said, your baby is normal. Nothing wrong with him. He will... <laughs> I know what happened. Miracles still do take place. Miracles, medical science said one thing. God said another. So thank you for your prayers. It's overwhelming to see how many people are praying for us. All right. We're going to let our seniors recess out. After our benediction, would you go ahead and stand and let me voice our benediction, then let our seniors process out, and then you will be dismissed. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead, our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, may he equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, be glory forever and ever. And all God's people together say it.